Their experts claim it is safe for now, but we cannot, as San Francisco grows, have a building that might not survive a seismic event. There are many buildings downtown that do not go to bedrock. That's not necessarily a bad thing, or so the engineers tell me, unless they are as heavy as the Millennium. It's not unusual to do this type of a thing to a building. It's called underpinning. Uh, what is unusual about this is the size of the building. It would require digging up the sidewalks and disrupting downtown for a long period of time, but there is a potential engineering fix. Talking about uh, building around it, putting something around it in order to keep it straight. That's correct. Now to our ongoing investigation into San Francisco's Millennium Tower. Even as they attempted to fix the sinking and leaning tower, the problem is getting worse. That's a big red flag. It's tilting and leaning way more than what they predicted. Clearly, there's a, a skew or a deviation between what you thought was going to happen and what's actually happening out there. So this is a, it, it's a non-routine, non-standard project. It's not unusual to do this type of a thing to a building. It's called underpinning. So this is a, it, it's a non-routine, non-standard project. Not unusual. It's a non-routine, non-standard project. Um, it's in a, heavily congested city environment, and so the consequences, if you don't get it right, are pretty severe. The cure has been worse than the disease and has exacerbated the sinking and tilting. Do you feel satisfied with the answers you got today? Not really. Is there a ticking time bomb below the leaning Millennium Tower in San Francisco? I finally had a chance to get caught up on this project and complete my review of the design calculations and design uh, details for this project. And we're gonna go over what I found uh, in this video today. And it's a little unnerving to say the least. I think at a minimum, I hope some of the officials that are overseeing this project in San Francisco will take a serious look at this video and, and, and ask some really pertinent questions. As we go through this video, I'm gonna ask you guys to weigh in. I'm just gonna lay out the evidence for you and I'm gonna let you guys decide in the comments section below. Let's take a look. Okay, for those of you who are new to this channel, I've already covered this uh, building in four previous videos. I really recommend you go back and watch those to kind of get caught up on all of the craziness that's going on in San Francisco regarding Millennium Tower. But I'm gonna go ahead and give you an incredibly short brief right now. Uh, the Millennium Tower in San Francisco is the largest residential building there. Um, it was not built with a foundation to bedrock. Again, that's covered in the previous videos. So therefore, this building has been sinking since the day it was built. The original engineers who really had a hand in messing this whole thing up to begin with were rehired in order to come up with a fix for the building and to get this uh, fix designed and implemented, okay? The original engineers came up with a design that had 52 piles going to be installed around the perimeter of the building. I'll show you some pictures of that. And it eventually got reduced down to 18 piles. Okay, and the idea being that if we can get at least some of this building down to the bedrock, we can stabilize it. Um, but what has happened now is as this project has gone on, their solution has actually caused the building to sink even worse and even more. But now they're sort of getting caught up and they have now connected six of the 18 piles to the foundation. And we're gonna go into detail uh, in this video what those connections look like, how it all functions and works, and why I think there's a really big red flag problem that they're not addressing. There have been design concerns with the fix from the very beginning. Engineers on the outside, I'm not the only one, there's many, many of them, um, and they've all been weighing in and saying that the fix isn't right, the order of operations isn't correct, um, it just a lot of it just doesn't make sense, or the engineers that are implementing the fix are relying on principles that don't really make sense or they're not grounded in, in sound judgment. Um, I think one of the things that is problematic with this is that the design engineering team and a few other people in the engineering world that are friendly with these folks um, have put out there that, oh, we do this all the time. We, we, it's called underpinning. We underpin buildings all the time. It's not unusual to do this type of a thing to a building. It's called underpinning. I, I need to make it very clear that we have never in the history of, of humanity underpinned a building of this size, of this weight, in this nature, using this type of technique, this type of technology. It's never been done. Um, in the video uh, of, uh, of Ron Hamburger, the lead engineer for this, you know, he says that um, this is something that we do all the time. The only difference is a magnitude of scale. Well, 
this comparison is like saying, because I know how to fold and, and, and throw and fly a paper airplane, um, I should be able to design a shuttle to take me to the moon. The only difference is distance that it's going. I think it, it's sort of, uh, it's a bit misleading um, uh, to try to create an equivalency with something that we do on little tiny structures with little tiny foundation problems with little tiny loads to something that weighs m millions and millions and millions of pounds and could wipe out half of the, you know, the downtown area of San Francisco if it were to collapse. These are not comparative things. Um, the other thing too is that as this uh, repair gets implemented, and I'll show you where it gets connected and all that, the the um, engineers, there are engineers on the outside that are saying that this is going to put a massive stress on the foundation mat. They're very concerned about that. Um, and 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 the foundation mat has already shown examples of, of, of having problems and probably cracking due to severe dishing um, that it was already experiencing. I've covered that in previous videos. So let's get down into the um, design discussion and start taking a deeper look at this uh, structure. In this uh, picture here, you can see this is sort of a cutaway of the first floor of the building and the uh, uh, piles, these are the these are like the original piles here. I'm gonna circle them. So they're all kind of shown sticking down from the foundation mat, okay? Um, but they're gonna add new piles and, and, and these new piles are, are located right here. And they're gonna go all the way down to the bedrock at the, at the bottom here. And they're gonna connect to the side of the foundation mat. Now the way they connect to the side of the foundation mat is through these three structures that the design engineer has referred to as vaults, connection vaults, okay? So the pilings are gonna come up into these vaults. They're going to connect to um, a, a structural fuse system that he's designed. And that's really the crux of this video. We're gonna get into talking about that fuse system. And, and if you're familiar with the term fuse, think of like an electrical fuse, you know, it's meant to sort of, to, to blow in case anything goes wrong so as to not cause other excessive damage. But all of that takes place in these vaults, and then these vaults are essentially connected to the existing foundation laterally with a bunch of steel and a bit of keying in of the, of the concrete reinforcement. Now, this is a cross-section cutaway view of these vaults. And you can see here the, the scale, I'm gonna show you some photos here next. Um, but I'm gonna, I want to walk you through the vault real quick. So the upper part of the vault, uh, this ceiling, if you will, it gets poured last. And then there's going to be some manhole covers so that you can get into this area to, to work on this thing. Um, essentially over here on the right side, and you'll see this for all the details, this is the existing building over here. Okay. And so this, 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 all the area that's in gray over here, this is all part of our solid concrete vault area. And then the area that's in white in this void space is an area that you can actually walk around in and access inside the vault through the manholes. The idea is that the piling, which is coming up right up here through the middle, is essentially going to push back and, and lift this building back up into place, or at least stop this end of the building from sinking. Um, and it's gonna do that through this entire contraption here, this fuse contraption, which will break down a little bit more. But in order for you guys to get, and I'll break down all the little parts and stuff, but in order for you guys to get a better understanding of the size and scale, I wanna show you some photos of the excavation of the, um, the vault area. And here is the existing building on the right side of the image there. This, these steel bars are just for bracing for the, um, for the uh, soil retention area next to the road to keep that from collapsing in until they get everything poured. But you can see down at the bottom of the picture, these are the pilings coming up into the, um, into the uh, vault area. And then of course, this is a worker and you can see them working down in the vault area now. And, and this is, um, you'll see this later in a the detail. They're excavating out some of the existing um, foundation in order to key in and attach uh, the new foundation to that. But again, you can see the size of the area we're talking about and the size of these pilings in relationship to the size of the workers. This is showing some of the existing rebar sticking out of that excavated area and some of the new rebar that they have had to put in uh, in order to connect the, 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 the vault. So over on the right side of the picture is the vault area. And then over on the left side is the existing building again. 
And so you can see that they're kind of working all this rebar together because once this whole area gets filled with concrete, uh, it's gonna tie it all together. And then this picture here just is really great. It shows you the scale of these connections compared to the people working on them. The, these these uh, all threaded rods, these steel rods are two and three quarter inches in diameter. I mean, you can see the comparison to the guy's hand here that's working in this vault area space. And then these rods are attached to these steel I-beams sections and they have web stiffeners and a bunch of uh, elements added to them to beef them up. But those threaded rods go through that and then they connect essentially up at the top of those uh, to exert their force. And I'll go over all those forces with you. And then the rods go down into PVC pipes and they're greased so that the rods don't actually connect to any of this concrete as it gets poured around these rods. You don't want this concrete to touch and, and, and mess with those rods. And then this picture here shows, uh, now they're getting a little further along, they've cut the piling cap down a little bit and they've installed a, a, a jack here. And the jack essentially pushes upward, okay, against the steel beam and then the steel beam pulls against the rods so the rods have to exert an opposite force uh, uh, opposite direction force and so you're talking um about a million uh, pounds we call it a thousand kips a kip is a thousand pounds so a thousand thousand pounds is a million pounds so you're talking anywhere between um you know uh, uh, one million pounds and 1.38 million pounds um, of force is being exerted and then that has to get divided by four in order to get split into these four uh, uh, rods that go down deeper into the foundation plates. This is something that um, that that I, I, I think needs to really be looked at. Okay, because what you are essentially doing is you're taking the building over here, right? Now this building wants to go down with, with, with gravity. And what it will do is it will connect to the bottom of the vault through rebar over here. So there's a bunch of steel, a bunch of rebar. There's actually a, 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 a wedge connector, which I'll show you actually in the next frame here. So you can see that this, this, this undercut area here is what I'm talking about. So they connect the new concrete to the existing structure. So this existing structure wants to go down and it will connect through here. They don't show the rebar in this particular section, but there's a bunch of rebar in there. Now, what you need to understand is that this, this piling is not connected to the concrete. There's actually a greased sleeve around it, okay? I'll zoom in on this a little bit. So here it says, um, I don't know if you can read this note on the video, but it says, uh, fill the area with high temperature, multi-purpose grease. Um, and this is pointing to the all thread rods, but then there's also um, grease that's called out for the, um, for the uh, piling as well here to prevent the piling from sticking to the vault. So you want the piling to be able to slide up and down inside this vault. Okay, you want that kind of movement to be able to happen because what you want is you don't want load transferred directly from the vault to the, because you know the vault's connected very well to the building. So you don't want any forces to go from the vault in directly to the, the, uh, the piling, that would not be good. So the piling comes up through the vault, not touching the vault in theory. And then you've got this hydraulic jack, which I showed you um, in the picture. You can, you can see it here. So we're talking about this hydraulic jack. And you've got this hydraulic jack, which is pushing up essentially against the steel beam. Now the building wants to go down. The hydraulic jack pushes up against the beam, which creates a downward force into the piling. So this is how we're gonna transfer this force to this force. We wanna transfer the building downward gravity force into the piling. And that's why I drew those two arrows there. And then the way this is going to happen is essentially this hydraulic will push upwards, which will then pull against these all thread rods. Okay, so they're pulling up against the, uh, the, these, these all thread rods and these all thread rods have to anchor down below. So again, as you push up here, you are pulling down here and we call this you know, an equilibrium of forces. So whatever force you have here, because we have four bars, that force gets divided by four. So you'd have four of these uh, uh, resistant tensile forces in these all thread rods. 
Now, at the bottom of the all thread rods, so here's your all thread rods coming down. And at the bottom of these all thread rods, they connect to a little steel plate. And I blew it up over here on the, on the uh, right side of the image so that you can see it better. But essentially, two of the rods on one side connect to a steel plate and the two of the rods on the, on the other side connect to a steel plate. Now, what you have to remember is the steel rods are encased in grease inside a PVC pipe. So the steel rods aren't connected to the concrete either. So the, so the, the, the piling itself is not connected to the vault and the bars aren't connected to the vault. So the only thing transferring forces from the vault to the piling are these little tiny steel plates down here at the bottom. And you can see in the note here that the engineer has it called out that it's a one and a half inch by six and a half inch by one foot one inch steel plate. And that's for a pair of, of, of bars. And so the, uh, the, the plate essentially is drawn right here. I'll kind of highlight it in for you. Oops. So there's your, there's the steel plate essentially. And this thing's only six and a half inches wide and the holes that would have been drilled through it were probably close to three inches in order to accommodate the two and three quarter inch uh, bolt that's going through it. So you don't have a lot of steel on either side. And then the idea and hope, and if you kind of look at this thing in 3D, if I, if I can draw it for you, um, you have that, that one. And then let's say you have the other uh, uh, all thread rod coming this way. So you essentially have both of these going into this into this uh, plate, okay? The idea being that this load that's on these all thread rods would be transferred to this little plate and then this little plate would exert that force throughout the concrete without completely pulverizing the concrete or without breaking the, the plate. Now, I've looked at this, I've looked through all of the engineers' design calculations, I've looked through the review team's commentary and calculations, and I can't see anywhere where they actually took the time to design this plate or calculate it. It's almost like they 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 put in some sort of uh, uh, values that would work physically, like you can physically get the bars in there, but nobody has sat down and done the computation. So now whenever you do a project like this, the engineer or the engineering team needs to sit down and they can model everything they want in a computer. A system like this that's this complex would be extremely difficult to model into a computer accurately and reliably and to take into consideration all the things we know. Taking a step back, the reason why is because computer models are based on the programmers who design them and based on the science that we know about materials, material sciences, how things work. And basically, my, I guess my point is, is that the computer modeling softwares that we have available to us are based off of known technologies, known things that work, and known sciences. And going back to the beginning of this video, I told you this was not a normal, <laughs> this is not a normal project. This has never been done before ever. So I would not rely on the computer modeling exclusively. You can go ahead and model it in the computer software, especially for more complex things like the seismic uh, reactions and stuff up to the building above. You can model the soils and all that things. But this particular connection, you really want to make sure you sit down and do your hand calculations to make sure you've got it right. Well, the engineer of record does do some of the calculations. Here is the, uh, I went through all of their calculations that they submitted as part of their permit. And this was the only sheet that mentions the tension rod and jacking system. It's the only page. And I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on these calculations. Okay, and I'm gonna to read to you what he writes in the calculations, which is exactly what I've been telling you in this video. The load, meaning the load from the building, is imparted to the piles, right? So we're trying to get from the building to the piles. So the load is imparted to the piles through hydraulic jacks, jacking beams, and tension rods. Now the tension rods he refers to as fuses because the idea is that these rods are going to be able to stretch. Now, this gets into a little bit more advanced engineering. Um, I don't know that I normally wanna to get too deep into it in this video, but essentially when you design a structure, especially when you're designing steel and tension, you normally, and I mean like 99.99% of the time, 
you want to keep your design loads, the loads that you're going to put on that steel, you want to keep it under what we call the yield strength of the steel. As long as you stay below the yield strength of the steel, you don't really run the risk of the steel ever rupturing or breaking uh, uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a sudden fashion. And so you can think of the yield strength as, as a rubber band. If you, if, you put, if you stretched out a steel bar, but you don't exceed the yield strength, it should return back to its original shape. Well, in order for this entire design to work and in order to convert and turn the tension rods into fuses, the design engineer sized the rods such that he would purposely exceed the yield strength of the rod. Okay? The next limit is the breaking point. It's the ultimate tensile strength of the steel. So he's playing in this, in, this, in this area between the yield strength of the steel and the ultimate strength of the steel. Um, in my experience, that's a very dangerous area to play in unless you're just barely going over and you've accommodated all that in there. But the actual design of this thing uh, um, relies on being in that field because the idea is that as long as you've passed the yield strength of the steel, then you can measure visual, visibly the load or through measuring devices, you can measure how much the building has deflected by measuring how much these rods have stretched. However, if things move too quickly or people can't get in there to adjust the hydraulic jacks or the, the monitoring reports turn into weekly reports, but you know it's not frequent enough or they turn into monthly reports and years go by, if these things rupture, you're gonna have a problem just based on the design. But the whole design is based on people are gonna be going in these vaults, they're gonna be checking things, everything, everything will be maintained over the next 50 years. Don't worry, guys. But that's actually not my problem. My problem is the tiny little plate that the thre threaded rods connect to down in the concrete. You can't visibly inspect them, you can't monitor them. And I performed my own calculations on these plates and they don't pass. They cannot take the load in shear that these bars are putting into them. And if you look at this calculation sheet, this is the only calculation sheet that the engineer of record has provided. And I'll go on to read it. It says the tension rods are intended to yield as the building continues to settle over time while protecting the piles from excessive loading, which would be detrimental to the existing mat foundation. Strain in the rods is limited to 5% at maximum settlement of eight inches. So again, he's planning on letting these rods stretch out, worst case scenario, right? He doesn't want them to stretch out, but they're designed to do that. Now, if you look at his calculations, he did two calculations. There are three components though to this thing. There is the, uh, the hydraulic jack you don't need to worry about. That's a pre-engineered product. The piling you don't need to worry about. He already calculated that in other calculations. But when you're talking about this fuse system, okay, you're talking about the, 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 everything beyond the jack. So between the hydraulic jack and the rest of the building, which you have the steel beam, you have the four threaded rods and you have the steel plate. Well, in this calculation here, the first calculation they did, they calculated the stress in the rods and going through and checking it, it all checks out and looks fine. Of course, he's designing it to be 102% loaded. That's not particularly something I think is smart or wise, but mathematically you should be able to, 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 to push it 102% past its yield strength. Um, but this is a calculation for the threaded rods, the four bars. This down here is a calculation for what he calls the jacking beam, that, that steel I-beam, chunk of steel I-beam with all the web stiffeners and everything I showed you in the beginning of the, of the video. And so he has a calculation for that. But there is no calculation for the steel plate at the bottom where the threaded rods are supposed to transfer all the load. Now, to put this into perspective, each of these rods is supposed to transfer... 250 to 300 and I think 40,000 pounds. I'm sorry. Yeah, 250 to 340,000 pounds per bar because the total design capacity for the um, for the entire system is 1380 kips. Now kips is a thousand pounds. So we're talking each piling is supposed to exert up to 1.38 million pounds onto these four rods, you divide that by four and that's what you get. And when then you take that load and you look at that little tiny teal, steel plate that's in the concrete, I mean, this thing is you know about this big and it's about that thick. I mean, this is not a big piece of steel that these rods are connecting to. 
and it's essentially just friction setting inside the concrete. Yes, there are some bars that go across the um, plate in order to transfer load to the rest of the of the um, of the uh, vault concrete, but there's nothing there to actually protect um, the 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 steel plate itself from failing and shear and having that bolt pull through and break through that steel plate. So I I, I really hope that you know if you're if you're watching this video and you have any power, any say at all in San Francisco uh, dealing with this project, I, I would I would just, please prove me wrong, but make the engineer of record provide the calculations, make them go back and check those plates because right now the first six pilings are only loaded to uh, half of their final design load. At that load, those plates are fine. But if they finish the next 12 and then they go ahead and take all 18 and they jack them up to a million pounds per piling, and I'm correct, you may have a cascade of failures on your hand, which would render the entire project a total waste of time and money. So I think it's pretty serious. It's at least worth double checking because right now going through everything, I've been through the EDRT comments. I've been through the calculations. I cannot find anywhere where anybody has even considered this plate. And it's literally one of the three most critical components of the entire project. Um, and that kind of goes into talking a little bit of a discussion about the peer review process for this project. I emailed the, um, the uh, building department for, the, um, for C City of San Francisco who's overseeing this project and I asked them, has anybody done an independent design and calculation review? And because a lot of times, like when you look at bridges and other major structural uh, infrastructure components, you have the design engineer and the design engineer performs his own calculations, but then you have another engineering firm which takes the design firm's design and then they perform their own analysis and their own calculations to verify whether that design will work. What they responded to me was, well, it was basically a response from authority. They, they, they essentially said in their email that they have uh, three structural engineers on staff at the building department and that all of the drawings and calculations were reviewed by the engineering design review team. Now, this is made up of two um, uh, university professors and two practicing uh, engineers in the engineering industry. But when you go back and you look through the notes from the um, EDRT design review team, and you look at what they uh, have reviewed and what they've talked about, they, they, they admit that they're not actually performing any of their own calculations and, and reviews. I wanna show you um, their uh, scope. In their first report in 2019, after reviewing the fix, they produced a, a report, and in that report they had um, a scope of, of, of what they were you know, proposing to do and what they had done in this, in this project. And they said here, the EDRT, and again, that's the Engineering Design Review Team, the EDRT scope is limited to engineering design peer review. That's not the same thing as independent calculations, okay? They said that their scope is limited to engineering design peer review where our findings, our findings are based on the review of materials submitted to us as indicated in our scope of work and comment log. This is a big C Y A cover your butt. Okay. This is their disclaimer essentially. And, and everybody does it. I'm not clean. I'm not blasting them for putting this in there. I put it in my own reports as well, but it has to be, they have to be very precise and very clear. They are saying that we are basing our findings on the calculations and the and the modeling prepared by the design team. Yes, we review the models. Yes, we review the calculations to see if there's errors, but clearly because they're not putting, putting on their thinking caps and doing their own independent true review, they also didn't catch or question or challenge the fact that nobody had run a calculation on this steel plate Literally the most important thing in the entire connection of everything is this steel plate and nobody has performed a calculation. They've never asked for a calculation. And this is the problem with this type of peer review is if you are shown A, B, and C, you're gonna review A, B, and C, but you may not step back and say, but should they have calculated D as well? And I think that's the problem we're running into here. 
Um, I, in, in August of 2021, the engineering design review team also uh, commented for the San Francisco Business Times. And they said, and I quote, we're relying now on the analysis, okay? So this is two years after the, the uh, first review that they did. They've been involved ever since. And in 2021 for the San Francisco Business Times, they say, we're relying on the analysis done very carefully for us by the engineers for the project in the past. So what they're essentially saying to the, to the San Francisco Business Times is, the engineers who screwed it up in the first place they're doing the fix and we're relying on the analysis done very carefully for us by the engineers. Notice they didn't say we're relying on our own analysis. They didn't say we're relying on our own calculations. They didn't say we're relying on our own, you know, anything. It's, it's, it's literally just, and if you watch and you read through the comments, and they do a very good job. I mean, but that's what they were hired to do. They weren't hired to do their own calculations. So I'm not really knocking the EDRT at all. They did exactly what they were hired to do, which is a peer review. But a project of this magnitude and of this importance with these types of possibly catastrophic results, if anybody gets anything wrong, should have really been independently calculated and handled by another engineering firm uh, independent of the design team. If you want to learn more about the kind of engineering principles talked about in this video, Brilliant has the skills and interactive learning tools you need. If you haven't signed up for Brilliant yet, now is the best time. With a 30-day trial period, you can learn new STEM skills and become unofficial experts in engineering, science, artificial intelligence, and technology. Using the Brilliant app is about growing your mind and learning useful things about how the physical world works. The content is hands-on and allows you to learn by actually doing and interacting with the puzzles and lessons. You can learn at your own pace and new content is added all the time to keep you learning for life. The courses I have done include scientific thinking, logic, and classical mechanics. I am super excited to start learning more about astrophysics since I already have a love for photographing the stars. You can impress your friends with newly gained knowledge or help solve world problems through science and innovation. And don't forget, you can gift a subscription to someone else. This could be a really cool gift to yourself and a family member or close friend. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org forward slash building integrity or click on the link in the description below. And remember, the first 200 of you will get 20% off of your premium annual subscription. Thanks for watching.